We invite you, Holy Spirit, to anoint the words that you've given me to speak. Use them, Father God, to set captives free today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, welcome. So good to see you guys, and I'm very thankful to have the opportunity to, to stand here and speak to you today. First thing I want to ask, it's not a very spiritual question, but who here has a favorite TV show that you watch every week? Who wants to tell me what it is? Oh, that's it. That's my show right there. Thank you, Christina, with the new baby in the house. Oh, come on. All right. I'm sorry, but we have to stop and ex be excited about a growing family. You want to stand and show us the baby? Is he sleeping? He's sleeping. Shh. He's sleeping. If he's like mine, he will sleep during worship and then wake up during the word. Hallelujah. I hope we're all awake during the word. Anyway, well, that's my favorite show. This is Us. And I wanted to start today by talking about that show. Quick premise of the show, it is about a blended family of five. They're two parents, three kids. Two of the kids are twins. One is adopted. And the entire show is based on how this very loving and diverse family overcomes their day-to-day -day challenges and obstacles of life together. But we don't have to turn on the TV to see what a blended, crazy, diverse, sometimes dysfunctional family looks like, do we? Just look around this room for a second. We have all kinds under one roof, all different shapes, all different sizes, all different colors. We've stood with each other through the best days and we've held each other up through some of our worst days. And with all of that, with all of our differences, there's one thing that is certain. We're the family of God. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. This is us. And today, I wanna talk about God's purpose for togetherness. Relationships, people coming together. If you know me, you know that that's something I'm really passionate about. I love people. And it actually energizes me to be around other people. You know, some of you probably remember in the old building when we started down for services, I know Cecily remembers, it was great. We used to have uh, friends come up and visit us from Stoneham. They would enjoy the service and then they would come over afterwards. And I know Cecily can relate to this, but if you've led worship for two hours straight, it can be exhausting, like in a good way, but it is exhausting. And there were so many times where we'd be driving home from church and I would just say to Mike, what were we thinking? Why did we invite people over to our house? I'm so tired. But it would never fail. The minute we would walk in the door, the minute our friends would come in and we'd sit around the table and we'd start eating, it was like I'd catch a second wind. And I don't know, you know, why that is, but if I, if I step back and I ask myself, I believe it's because God created us so that we would flourish the most when we come together with others. So my first point is, we were created for togetherness. In Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. I find it interesting that after God was done with all of his work, the very first order of business was finding a companion for Adam. He wasn't satisfied with Adam being alone. I think this gives us great insight into God's nature as the supreme relational being, and he's created us after his image and likeness. God knew that Adam would need another person to be around in order for there to be a clear representation of what heaven is like here on earth. Now, you know, Adam had plenty of animals to keep him company, but interacting with animals is not where Adam's character and nature would become more like God's. Godly character is developed when we get around other people. And in Adam's case, God gave him a family a wife and kids, people who had the ability to challenge him, to disagree with him, to help develop him. This is where Adam really learned to love like God. 
to be merciful, to be kind, to be patient and forgiving, even when poor decisions were being made. Let's talk about that for a second. Could we all agree they pretty much had it made living in the garden, right? I mean, come on. Everything was provided for them, total uninterrupted communion with God the Father, yet somehow, somehow they still managed to sin and mess it all up. I mean, really? Manipulation, deception, jealousy, murder? Oh my goodness. It sounds like a bad reality TV show. And this is just the first two generations, but this is us. And I'm so thankful that God made a way for all of that with the blood of Jesus. And I think he knew that it was in facing each other with all of our junk and working it out that we would actually become more like him. My second point is togetherness has benefits. It's only when we come together that we actually put into practice the act of releasing heaven on earth. All of the blessings of heaven get poured out when we join with those that God has placed around us. We can't do this alone. Psalm 133 says, how good and pleasant it is when God's people dwell together in unity. And it goes on to say, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life, forevermore. One of the areas where I have the opportunity to uh, cultivate unity and togetherness is within the microcosm that is the music ministry. Uh, within our team, basically what happens is just a smaller version of what happens in the church as a whole. With so many people coming together with so many different backgrounds, you have to know it's a breeding ground for conflict. And when I first took over the team, that really used to scare me, to be honest with you. But now, you know, we've learned to embrace it because we know that um, through that process, we've discovered how to have healthy conflict resolution. We don't gossip about each other. If there's a problem, we go directly to the person and hopefully in love, we deal with the issue. We don't go out with our problems, we go up. And here's why. When we gossip, when we communicate our offenses outward, it actually spreads the offense. My problem becomes your problem. You get mad at that person for me. And before we know it, we begin to tear apart the fabric of our family. And just like that, unity can be broken. But God reveals his benefit of unity and togetherness when he says we are blessed when we come together and he anoints unity. And I've discovered, you know, there's really no easy way around this. Unity has to be cultivated so that it can grow and so that it can mature. It's not a destination. It's a lifelong journey cultivating unity. And on the team, we're happy to do it because we know that when we cultivate uni unity, when we protect unity, that God will anoint it. And listen, it's the anointing of God, not how good we sound, that breaks the yoke and sets the captives free. If we want to make a difference in your lives, we need to be unified. But God didn't reserve the concept of unity just for us people up here on the platform. God's desire is that we would take this togetherness model and we would utilize it everywhere in all aspects of our life because God wants to anoint every aspect of our lives. The anointing of God is not reserved for these four walls, but God wants you to be anointed in the conference room at work. He wants you to be anointed in the classroom and on the football field. A few months ago, pastor preached a sermon based on Isaiah 58. And if you haven't read it, that's your homework for this week, okay? Uh, she preached on some things and she was talking about togetherness and the benefits of togetherness in her sermon and she made a couple points that I hadn't seen before in reading Isaiah 58. One of the things that she said was that it's customary for Jewish people to have a corporate mindset. They believe that they're family and they believe that each member of the family truly impacts one another. So if one member of the family is doing well, 
whole family is doing well. If one member of the family is hurting or going through a trial, they all rally together. They're all hurting, and they join together as one to help that family. And I have to just tell on myself for a second because that convicted my heart so much. I just remember sitting there in the chair and thinking, wow, we're, we're one. We are one. And how many times have I come in those doors and I have been so focused on the task at hand, the things that I have to do. And let me just say this, people come before task. But I have come in so focused that I forget that there are other people today that you've come in here and it took everything that you could to get in those doors. Some of you are dealing with life struggles that I can't even fathom. Some of you have lost loved ones, you've lost jobs, you're battling sickness in your body. Some of you, this is the only time that you get to be with other people and the rest of the week you are totally alone. And as humans, I think we judge the exterior, we forget to make eye contact, we keep our distance. It's not intentional. I think we can just get so caught up in our own stuff that we forget that this is about connection. It's about coming together. And sometimes I think we let those awesome differences that we talked about in the beginning, our age, the color of our skin, our gender, even our financial background, all of that, we can let those become walls that divide us. And we never learn how to let those walls down. We come into this place together, but we never allow togetherness in here. That's not God's best for us, church. God's best is relational connection, caring for each other. When we live like that, we reveal God and we release heaven on earth. So I already told you that your homework is to read Isaiah 58. But let me just tell you a couple of the benefits of togetherness found in that, in that word. God says that we'll be well-watered gardens whose waters never fail, and I never get sick of hearing that because I want my life to have rivers of living water that refresh people. We'll be called repairers of broken walls. We'll be called restorers of streets with dwellings. It all, to me, sounds like reconciliation. Amen? That's God's plan for us, and those are all benefits of togetherness. Another benefit of togetherness that I'd like to talk about is found in Matthew 18, 20, and I'm going to read this out of the message translation. It says, when two of you get together on anything at all on earth and make a prayer of it, my Father in heaven goes into action. When two or three of you are together because of me, you can be sure that I'll be there. I think we all know that God is omnipresent, right? He's always here. What Jesus is referring to is the corporate anointing. Let me explain. If you didn't know, I love to worship God. It's one of my favorite things to do. My favorite thing is to sit at the piano and just spend hours worshiping the Lord and allowing him to take time to sing over me and pour into me. It's where I really get my life. It's what sustains me every day, that alone time with God. However, there's something wonderful and incredible that happens when we come together and we worship together and we hear the word of God and we pray together. That's called the corporate anointing. And we see it demonstrated in 2 Chronicles 5.13, and I'm going to just paraphrase this for you. Basically, what's happening is the musicians and the singers, they are coming together, just like we did this morning. And they're worshiping God, and they are praising him, and they're singing, He is good. His love endures forever. And God responded by pouring out his glory, by pouring out his, so, his spirit so heavily that they couldn't even stand. They couldn't perform their duties. You know, I've been in services like that here at CLC where the presence of God was so strong that I couldn't even stand. We also see the corporate anointing demonstrated on the day of Pentecost. In Acts 2, it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly the sound of a blowing violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. 
All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And later in Acts 2, it says every day, every day, not one time, and then they were done for the year, but every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily. They were all together. They ate together. They prayed together. They worshiped together. They went to soccer games together. Everything that they did was together. And they were glad. And people got saved because of it. To me, this is a beautiful picture of the kingdom of heaven. Total, uninterrupted, unselfish communion. That's what's happening in heaven, and that's what God longs to see manifested on the earth. Even when Jesus gave the model prayer, his focus was not on individual needs, but his focus was instead to pray and stand in the gap corporately. In Matthew 6, he says, This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us, us, this day, our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. After lifting up who God is and his holiness, the entire prayer is from a corporate perspective. It's not one person praying for their own needs. It's one person for all people praying and asking God, provide for all of us, God, forgive us all. Lead and guide us all. And just like the point that Pastor made in her sermon about how we really do affect each other, Jesus is really echoing that. And he's showing us the importance of not just looking out for our own needs, but really looking out for the needs of others. And we don't have to make it complicated. The most simple thing that we can do is just obey the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's it. When God says, do it, just do it. His word says in Proverbs, don't withhold good when it's within your power to act. So I made a decision a long time ago. When the Lord says, feed someone, I just do it. I don't care if I don't have the time, I just obey. If he says, open your doors and have someone over, do it. Give, give that shirt to somebody who needs a shirt, just give. Be a friend. Be willing to hold each other accountable. Be willing to be committed to relationship, even when it's not easy. You know, Mike and I, we've been in the church. Well, he's been in the church a lot longer than me, but I've been in the church here for about 20 years. And I have to say, I love you guys. I'm so thankful to call you my family. Every wonderful, monumental thing that has happened in my life has really happened under this roof. You know, I got, you know, well, I met Mike before I got saved, so that was pretty cool. I, I met him before I came here, but I got saved under this roof. We got married under this roof. We started our family under this roof. There's so many of you, you have developed me. You have poured into my life and mentored me and helped me to become the person that I am today. And so many of you have stood by us through wonderful, joyous times, and you've, you've stood there and you've held us up when we've gone through hard times, like losing loved ones and when we've lost jobs and fell on, you know, financial hard times. And most recently, when we bought our new house, so many of you came and supported us, and that was awesome. You did repair work to our old house so we could get out of it quickly. You, we sold it in 20 hours, and that's a miracle. Uh, you fed us, you packed, you moved. You know, Trinika and Heather came with me to the new house before it was ours, and we anointed it with oil, and we prayed, and we worshiped on the property, and we laughed because, thank God, nobody was living there, but we're like, man, people think we're crazy over here. But, And then so many of you texted me along the journey as we were waiting to get that response that they accepted our offer, and you're like, that's your land, that's your house. Where you'd go there, and you'd pray over the land, and you'd text me and say you were there praying for us. Man, that meant so much to us. We are so thankful for all of you, and there is no way we would ever want to do life without you. We're, t we're thankful for the togetherness that we have. 
But even hearing that testimony, I realize that there are some of us here today, if you had to choose between spending time with others and being alone, you choose to be alone. And don't get me wrong, a planned time of isolation can be beneficial. You know, Jesus, he went off alone into the wilderness to pray, and he went off alone to the mountain to pray. But even Jesus returned from the wilderness, and he returned from the mountain because whatever God poured into him while he was there, he needed to bring it back to the people and pour it out to the people. Just like when I'm alone and I'm worshiping God at the keyboard, those songs, that revelation that he pours into me in that time of isolation, I bring it out here and I pour it out here. I think we need to ask ourselves, are these healthy walls of isolation or is this something that the enemy is using to keep me divided, to keep me out of relationship with my brothers and my sisters in Christ? We can't fulfill God's plan for our lives if we're alone. My third point is we need to identify the unhealthy walls and tear them down. So what's the purpose of a wall? To divide, to separate, to seclude, maybe to protect? And if we're honest, I think some of us, we get real comfortable behind those walls. There's so many reasons why we put them up, why we hide, why we isolate. Offense, shame, fear, maybe self-protection. We reason within ourselves and we feel justified in putting them up. We feel justified in hiding. But again, that is not God's best for us. The government of heaven is based on relationship, togetherness, iron sharpening iron so that we can become more like God. That is God's best for us, and that's why the devil works so hard to destroy it. The devil knows if he can isolate us from God and from each other, we won't experience all of the blessings that we talked about, all of the benefits of togetherness, his presence, his provision. Today, I believe that God is calling us to tear down some walls. One of the walls I believe he wants us to tear down is the wall of shame. The devil has been using this wall since the garden to keep people out of relationship with God. Adam and Eve ate the fruit. Immediately they felt shame. They went and hid. They didn't just hide from God, but they held, hid from each other. And so many things can open the door to shame. Sin, disobedience, things that others have done to us that were out of our control. Shame can actually be passed down generationally. And there's a surefire way that we can tear down the wall of shame by doing what James 5.16 says, and that's confessing our sin so that we can be healed. To those of us today who may be isolating because of shame, God wants to heal you. And based on Webster's definition of heal, God wants to make you free from injury today. He wants to make you sound and whole. He wants to restore your health and cause you to overcome. God wants to mend your troubles. He wants to patch the, debri the, the, the breach in your life and repair the division. He wants to restore you to your original purity. All we have to do is confess our sins. And I'm so thankful that this is a safe place to do it. I know because I've done it. You know, our pastors have worked very hard to create an environment and a place and a culture where people can come, we can take our masks off, we can be real about our life struggles here. We're not gonna be judged. We're not gonna be ostracized. Pastor Ron always says, the church should be a place where we can come and have a mental breakdown in peace, where we can confess our sin to one another and we're not gonna be shocked by it. And let me say this, we don't confess sin to glorify sin. We don't confess sin to give each other license to do it. We confess sin so that we can be healed. We confess it so that we can be free, so that we can be purified. When I confess my sin, 
Walls come down in my life. Shackles of shame get broken off. And when I'm free, I can help set my brothers and my sisters free. And if you ask me, that's what revival is. People that were once bound, setting other people free. I believe when we as the church start doing that, and today is the day, that the light of God is gonna be so released in this place that we won't be able to keep people out of here because they're gonna see authenticity and they're gonna see a safe place where they can let their walls down. Today, if you're dealing with shame or any hidden sin, I've got great news for you. We know the God that forgives, he heals, he delivers, and at the end of the service, we're gonna have some time, we're gonna pray. Our God is greater than all sin, and he loves to make us clean. That's what he does. Another wall that the devil loves to use is the wall of offense. If you only knew what they did to me, you'd understand why I have my walls up, why I stay away, why I don't trust anyone anymore. Listen, I'm not trying to make light of what happened to you. I'm not saying that it doesn't matter. It does matter. It matters so much that Jesus was nailed to the cross for that situation. He suffered the penalty of sin. He took the blame because someone had to pay for what happened to you. And what happened to you grieved the heart of God. It was wrong. That's why Jesus died for that situation, so that you could keep on living and not let what happened to you become who you are or thwart the plan of God on your life. Today, we can tear down the wall of offense by doing what Jesus tells us to do. And that's simple. It's just forgive. Forgive. Be free. Let it go. Let what he did on the cross be enough for you. Let his blood satisfy the debt that was owed so that you can live the full life that God intended you to live with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Another wall that I want to talk about, and this is my last one, it's simple. Just not making the time to come together. In Hebrews 10, and I'm going to paraphrase this, Paul is talking to the church and he's encouraging them in their faith. And he's saying, hey guys, stay in the habit of coming together. Don't fall into the habit of isolation like some people have, but keep meeting together. Keep encouraging each other. Keep loving each other. He realizes that it's human nature to isolate and retreat, and he's urging them to continue to come together. Many times, I think we simply just get so busy with other things that before we know it, there's no room left in our schedules for togetherness. But today, we can choose to make togetherness a priority in our lives. I'd like to ask everyone to stand as I read my last scripture. Matthew 12, 46. And Jesus was speaking to the crowd. His mother and brother stood outside asking to speak to him. Someone told Jesus, your mother and your brothers are standing outside and they want to speak to you. Jesus asked, who's my mother? Who are my brothers? And then he pointed at his disciples and he said, look, these are my mothers and my brothers. Anyone who does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. I'd like for you all to look around the room for a moment. Make eye contact with each other. These are your people. These are the ones that God has entrusted into your hands. This is your family church. This is us. God has planted us here in this time, in this season, in this community of believers. And he's entrusted us with each other's lives to care for each other to undergird, to support, to love each other. And each relationship is an opportunity to expand God's family, to grow the kingdom of God. 
But we can't do that alone. We can't make disciples by ourselves. Can we commit today to making disciples? Can we commit to allow our differences to bring us together and not tear us apart? Can we become stronger as one? Can we tear down the walls that divide us and become purposeful at cultivating togetherness? I believe if we practice togetherness within these walls, we can be effective in advancing God's kingdom outside of these walls. In a few minutes, we're gonna have an opportunity to take communion together. You know, I can't think of a more perfect time to do so after talking about God's purposes for togetherness. You know, the last thing that Jesus did and the first thing we're gonna do when we get to heaven is take communion. But before I do, I'd like to pray with you. If there are some here, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, but right now I believe that you're feeling a tugging in your heart. I believe you want to know him. And I want to tell you guys, this is the most important thing that can happen today. Not what I say. You getting to meet Jesus for the first time. And I need to tell you that the communion table is for family members. And we would be honored to have you at the table with us today. If you would like to be saved and knit into the family of God, our wonderful, crazy, blended, but very loving family, I want to ask you right now, boldly lift up your hands. Boldly lift them up, and we're going to pray with you in a moment. Don't be ashamed. Maybe you were once a part of God's family, but you've drifted away. And today you recognize that God is calling you to come back home. If you'd like us to pray with you, I encourage you just go ahead and lift up your hands right now as well. Don't worry, no one's judging you. We're not worried about why you chose to leave. We're just thankful and grateful that you're coming back. And maybe today, for some of us, it's a, a day of reckoning. We realize that we've had so many walls up that our walls have actually become a prison. And today we want to be free. Today the walls are coming down. If that's you, you want the walls to come down in your life, I encourage you to lift your hands right now. Romans 10, 9 says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead that we will be saved to those who want to be saved or recommit your lives to Christ today I want you to boldly pray this prayer with me and then afterwards I'm just going to pray a prayer over the rest of us okay so Heavenly Father I know I'm a sinner I cannot save myself I need you I gratefully receive the gift of your salvation. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to earth. I believe you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross for my sins, and you rose from the dead on the third day. Thank you for bearing my sins. Thank you for giving me the gift of eternal life. Come into my heart. Be my savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Heavenly Father, I thank you for what you're doing in this place. And Jesus, I thank you that your blood covers all sin and your anointing breaks every yoke. Jesus, we ask you to come right now and do what you do best. Come and set the captives free. Right now, we tell the walls of shame to come down in Jesus' name. We decree and declare there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We command the walls of offense to come down and we release right now a spirit of forgiveness and reconciliation. 
Holy Spirit, we ask that you would put a fire in our hearts for the family of God, for togetherness. Don't let our love wax cold, God. Help us to obey your leading, Holy Spirit. Come and knit our hearts together in unity. And as we grow and mature, God, anoint us to bring others into your family and to set the captives free. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. God is so good.